Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. I am currently heat treating a batch of this brand new model that I worked up yesterday actually. And I'm, I think I'm gonna call it the Fire Creek EDC. Pretty excited about how these little guys are turning out. But I was thinking about something today and that has to do with steel and heat treating and building edge tools, specifically knives out of steel. And that is kind of uh, the age old problem with steel and that's what I want to talk about in the different ways that that's been overcome or can be overcome. See, it might surprise you to hear me say that steel is not really a great material for knives because, you know, most knives are made out of steel and so that probably seems like a silly thing to say. But let me explain what I mean by that. To have a tool that holds an edge well you have to have a combination of properties you got to have something that is harder than what you're cutting but you also have to have something that's not so hard and brittle that it's going to crack or chip at the edge specifically and so you need a level of toughness as well to whatever you're using for this edge or this blade to cut things and there's much harder material than steel out there, obviously, that would be much better at cutting most things in that single respect. But there's a reason that knives are not made from pieces of diamonds. Aside from the expense, of course, it really wouldn't make a very good knife. Because although diamonds are very hard, they're not very tough and so, if you apply any significant amount of pressure, which is something that the edge of a knife blade undergoes, think about it, a microscopic edge, the amount of force that you're putting on it just by hand is uh, exponentially higher based on that extremely thin uh, cross section right there at the edge. And a hard brittle material simply isn't going to hold up to that. So that leaves us with materials that have a combination of hardness and toughness that we can somehow incorporate together and make the best of both worlds that we can. There's different ways that uh, people have done this over the centuries and millennia. And there's two specific categories to this, kind of thinking specifically about the actual edge of the blade and then the entirety of the blade itself. And depending on the usage and what it's for, that's going to vary. Because see, if you have a sword or something like that, that's going to be essentially an impact weapon and maybe even come in contact with materials such as armor or chain mail or heavy leather, things like that. It's gotta be tough enough to withstand some kind of heavy impact, but it also has to be hard enough to cut something and not just kind of bend or deform under pressure so much so that it doesn't even cut. But you can't have your sword snapping in half on the battlefield. That's not a good look and it's not great for uh, surviving a battle, which uh, would be bad enough as it was. So in this particular case, there's different ways that different cultures combined steel or iron of various properties to get an overall very strong or tough blade that for the most part had a harder edge that they could cut with but keep the sword from breaking. You know, we think of like the, uh, the samurai swords or the Japanese swords and there was a variety of methods that they used to build those and, and uh, one of the most common was to sandwich a high carbon steel over a lower carbon core and so that the interior of that blade, at least towards the spine, would be softer and you combine those two, you have a tougher blade with a harder edge. We think of some of the Viking swords where they would combine like a rod of iron and a rod of steel and sometimes twist or forge weld those together and twist them, things like that. But the overall uh, construction of the sword contained a lower carbon and higher carbon pieces of iron and or steel. And through these methods or things like this, they were able to achieve a overall much tougher blade than if you were just to use high carbon steel or what they had that was the equivalent of that or a much harder blade than if you're just using softer iron or low carbon steel 
And for a long, long time, this was the extent of what blacksmiths, bladesmiths had to work with when it came to trying to walk the tightrope between a hard cutting edge and a tougher blade. But so much for swords. Obviously, most cutting tools in the history of mankind would have been something much smaller, more personal, used every day for any variety of tasks, just for basic living and or survival. But we see some of these same methods used to accomplish this tightrope walk between hardness and toughness within the same blade. The Sanmai or laminate blade is a great example of that and we still see that in traditional Japanese bladesmithing today as well as other bladesmiths and uh, traditions. Some of the Scandinavian or Nordic knives were also laminate steel for, for quite some time and uh, they utilized this method as well. So a lower carbon cladding or a high carbon uh, steel core and so in that you would get the qualities of a tougher stronger blade that's not going to snap in half under pressure but you've got a higher carbon and a harder edge right there where you're trying to cut stuff with now this isn't perfect because that high carbon harder edge is still susceptible to chipping or brittle behavior to some degree but this was kind of the extent of what you could work with within this high carbon steel uh, realm. And so this is pretty much the pinnacle of what you can do with that. And make no mistake, it is very good. Until the advent of alloy steels, like high alloy steels, alloy steels of any kind around the end of the 19th century, there wasn't much you could could gain beyond doing some really good bladesmithing and blacksmithing on the best piece of uh, steel that you could find and combining these different properties perhaps. Another way that is this is accomplished is through differential heat treating. So you have a piece of steel, a, a blade that is of a homogeneous, uh, homogeneous construction, so it's just the same piece of steel or same properties all the way throughout, but you heat treat parts of it differently and there's different ways to do that maybe you've seen guys edge quench so they'll heat up you know you can heat up the entire blade or you can just heat up the, the blade itself and not the handle and then just quench up to a certain level so that the edge is quenched and the rest of the blade is left out of the quench and then it's going to be softer and tougher and you've got a harder edge so edge quenching is one way to get a differential heat treat and to obtain different properties out of the same piece of steel Something similar to that is something like differential tempering. So you heat the entire blade up, quench the whole thing, and then come back and temper out things like the tang, the handle, the spine, so that those are all softer. And the truth is most knife makers or bladesmiths don't really have to worry about different methods of combining different types of steel because with the types of alloys that we have available to us today, you can build a really, really good knife that has the properties of toughness and edge holding within the same piece of steel with a homogeneous heat treat. And that's like I say, probably 95, maybe more percent of every knife built today. And there's nothing wrong with that. But there are limitations to it. Like <clears throat> I can't heat treat this as hard as you could without worrying about the overall toughness of the blade. This is going to hold a really good edge but there are limitations to what this steel can do. So for example, these knives right here that I'm working on, these are San Maya blades. This is a different steel here in the core and then a 410 stainless cladding that's forge welded to it. And you've got two very different types of steels here. What that does is allow me to, like I mentioned earlier, heat treat this steel to a level of cutting edge ability when it's clad with this softer, tougher steel that I would not be comfortable doing if it was just that coarse steel. So this uh, edge steel here is 125 CR1. It has uh, a quarter percent, it's got one and a quarter percent carbon in it, which is a whole quarter percent more than the 52100 steel. And it's got next to nothing as far as alloy components in it beyond that. So the way you're able to work this in a more traditional fashion and the way it responds to heat treat is pretty cool, but it doesn't have the same level of toughness that the 52100 or 
even more so like the 80 CRV2 is going to have. And so to get the best out of this steel, what I've done and what many people have done similarly is to clad it in this tougher stainless steel cladding. And in this way, we can get an extremely keen, very sharp, excellent uh, abrasion resistant within the high carbon steel class on this edge, but still have a blade that is very tough overall. I'm getting ready to quench the next three of these uh, Fire Creek EDCs. I guess that's what I'm gonna call it here. Really what it comes down to is uh, pairing, one of the things it comes down to is pairing the type of steel with the intended application. That's, that's really important. There is no one steel that just does everything really, really well. And that's why, you know, I use a variety of steels. For my um, heavy duty chopping knives, things like that, I like ADCR V2 because it is super tough, just as it is, and I'm able to heat treat that with a homogeneous piece of steel and a homogeneous heat treat and get excellent edge retention and excellent toughness. And that's based on that particular steel, that particular alloy. Here we've got the 52100 steel, and it's also very tough, but it has a higher carbon content, which gives us the potential for better abrasion resistance. And in a smaller EDC type or general use knife, even up into a mid-size heavier use knife, 52100 steel is very appropriate and it's going to perform very well and I've, I've gotten really good feedback on it from a lot of people and so it's an excellent choice and again this is a uh, homogeneous piece of steel with a homogeneous heat treat and we've got excellent properties on both ends of the spectrum just with this process right here but then if you want to sort of push into the outer limits of what's possible with high carbon steel edge retention and things like that. You start getting into the higher carbon, like the 125CR1, which those blades, these blades are water quenched. And uh, this is, that's something you can do. That's really something that's necessary to get the most out of that steel because it does not have alloy content to uh, assist with the heat treating process like 52100 does or 80 CRV pure, many other alloys today. And the results that you get from that are worth the time and effort. And uh, they're, it's pretty cool, but it costs a little bit more in time and effort. And so again, pairing the steel for the application and then pairing the knife with the uh, end user. You know, not everybody's gonna want to spend a little extra money on, on a water quenched sand mai or laminate blade. But there are people who will and they're gonna really enjoy that. A lot of people are really gonna wanna just stick with uh, a little more um, affordable, but still very, very good functionality and performance that you're going to get out of a homogeneous steel heat treat. I thought it was an interesting thing to talk about and I'm going to finish heat treating these knives. I guess that's all I got for you guys today. So I appreciate you watching and uh, see you on the next video.